Sunny Bonani, Abangan Baum, and welcome to our 27th demonic in internal medicine in Shrine here. Hope you're all doing well, and you know, this is the day the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I greet you in Jesus' awesome name. Thanks for joining us. Today, we're talking about aortic regurgitation and some of its causes, and the eponymous clinical science associated with it. You know, what do you call a blood vessel with a carrot jammed into it? You call it a car carotid artery. And uh, once a patient went to his doctor and said, Doc, the double cheeseburger I had holds a very special place in my heart. The doctor replied, oh, mainly in your coronary artery. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So guys, when we speak of um, aortic regurgitation, we talk of it uh, in terms of the etiology as being either a valve problem or that which is an aortic root problem. Okay, an easy way to remember the etiologies is either congenital, like a bicuspid aortic valve, rheumatic in etiology, a sequelae of rheumatic heart disease due to endocarditis or due to aortic root dilatation, of which there are numerous causes, or a patient with marfanoid syndrome. So in terms of your valve abnormalities, we think about rheumatic heart disease, infective endocarditis, SLE, calcification, congenital, like we said, bicuspid valve, flay leaflet or osteogenesis imperfecta, drugs as well, like fenfludamine, uh, your anorexigenic drugs. Uh, causes related to aortic root dilatation includes aortic dissection, ankylosing spondylitis, syphilis, Marfan's, Ehlers-Danlos, hypertension, a bicuspid aortic valve, and cystic medial necrosis. And pathophysiology behind this is that essentially what you have is a leaky aortic valve. And initially, there's compensation with the left ventricular dilatation and eccentric hypertrophy, which will then manifest with palpitations and atypical chest pain. Importantly as well, we have a wide pulse pressure. And this is due to increased stroke volume with an elevation in the systolic blood pressure and regurgitation with rapid collapse of the arteries and a low diastolic pressure. Eventually, you end up with a situation where we have decompensation, which then leads to left ventricular dysfunction and eventually heart failure. Okay. So in terms of the signs, it's important to note that we have a collapsing pulse and a wide pulse pressure, which are probably two of the most important clinical signs to pick up in these patients. But the eponymous signs are numerous. Okay, so to this end, we speak about uh, quinky sign. So quinkies is essentially uh, a capillary pulsation in the nail beds. Uh, Corrigans is the so-called dancing carotids or prominent carotid pulsations. Demusset sign refers to head nodding in time with a heartbeat. Hill sign. Uh, refers to increased blood pressure, or at least more than 20 mls mercury in the legs compared with the arms. And this is further subdivided into uh, mild, moderate, and severe, with severe being a difference of more than 60 mls mercury, moderate being a difference between 20 and 40 mls mercury, and um, mild being uh, at least about between well, 20 mls mercury uh, higher in the legs compared with the arms. Then we have... Um, Muller's sign, which refers to pulsation of the uvula in time with a heartbeat. Durazier's sign, which refers to systolic di and diastolic murmur over the femoral artery on gradual compression of the vessel. All right. And usually you compress distally and you can hear the murmurs proximally. Then main sign refers to a decrease in the diastolic pressure of 15 mls mercury when the arm is held above the head compared to when the arm is at the level of the heart. All right. Then we have trope sign, which is a double sound heard over the femoral artery on compression of the vessel distally. And this is not the pistol shot sound that can be heard over the femoral artery with severe aortic regurge. Rosenbach's liver pulsation sign. Uh, here the liver pulsates in time with the heartbeat in the absence of tricuspid regurge. All right. Becker's sign refers to accentuated retinal artery pulsations. The infamous Austin Flint murmur refers to a short rumbling diastolic murmur thought by Flint to be due to functional mitral is caused by impinging of the aortic regurgitant jet on the anterior middle of our leaflet. Jet art science speaks to a positive spleen. Remember the other eponymous um, murmurs that are famous is the Karikum's murmur of uh, rheumatic mitral stenosis, which is uh, uh, you know a diastolic murmur, as well as the gram steel murmur of pulmonary regurgitant in pulmonary hypertension, also a diastolic murmur. Okay, guys, there you have it. QCD, HMD, meter in the bag. All right. And, um, yeah, uh, in terms of managing, okay, so in terms of your investigations, ideally you want to do a chest x-ray, which will show cardiomegaly, do an echocardiogram, ECG showing left ventricular hypertrophy, exercise stress test, you also want to do a cardiac catheterization. In terms of managing this, 
Uh, lifestyle changes, which entails salt restriction and diuretics. Medications, you want to reduce that afterload with vasodilators in the way of uh, ACE inhibition or ARBs or nifedipine. And indications for severe aortic um, uh, uh, um, regurge with symptoms. Um, you want to, and with LV dysfunction and LV dilatation, but not for long-term management of asymptomatic, mild to moderate AR and normal LV function. So ideally, you know, you do also want to eventually replace that aortic valve, and there are various indications for this. So a class one indication is the patient has symptomatic severe AR or asymptomatic chronic severe AR where the regurgitant fraction is above 50% and the regurgitant volume is above 60 mls per beat. And you also have a Doppler jet width of above 65% of the left and particular alpha tract and an LV ejection fraction of below 50% or severe AR and undergoing cardiac surgery for other reasons. All right. Um, so those are the class one indications. God bless you and I hope this video was helpful and take care and be safe.